five, four, three, two, one. Hello and welcome to Life in the Foam, the podcast about living outside of the mainstream media bubbles here in the 21st century. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Paul Levinson uh, of Media Studies at Fordham University. He's uh, an expert on Marshall McLuhan. He wrote uh, The Digital McLuhan and is also a science fiction author, writer of uh, The Silk Code and many other stories. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Professor Levinson last week at the launch event, the relaunch event, I should say, for the new print edition of Amazing Stories of Science Fiction magazine. So thanks for joining me, Professor. Hey, it's my pleasure. And I have to say, you know, it was a really auspicious occasion last week. I can't think of a better time to meet uh, an up-and-coming eminent podcaster because, as I probably mentioned last week, but in case uh, our audience didn't know, my very first fully professional publication of a science fiction story. You know, I had a couple in like semi-prose, semi-prosines as they're called, but my first fully professional publication was in Amazing Stories, uh, a piece called Albert's Cradle, a short story, and this was way back in 1993. So I was especially delighted to come up to Toronto last week for the relaunch event for the new Amazing Stories, which has my latest story, Time Travel Story, Slipping Time. And it was icing on the cake that you and I had a chance to talk. Uh, so uh, good connection. Absolutely. So um, this is the fourth episode of this podcast, and I've been uh, trying to find a way to um, really dig into the meat of Marshall McLuhan, um, because I'm sure a lot, lots of people, especially people I talk to, don't quite know who I'm talking about. So um, maybe we should just start off with a basic introduction to... Uh, who was uh, Marshall McLuhan? He, um, he was a professor at, U at uh, the University of Toronto who taught English, importantly, and he brought all sorts of um, poetry and artistic interpretation skills into reading modern media, like advertisements and whatnot, and sort of founded the whole science of uh, media ecology. Would, would you call that a fair summation? Yeah, very fair summation. And, you know, he was really someone who uh, was almost prescient about uh, the digital age that we're now in. Now, it's not that he had some kind of extrasensory perception or he was some kind of mystic, but uh, Marshall McLuhan was so in touch with the way human beings communicated that he realized, for example, as soon as the Telstar satellite was launched back in the early 60s, uh, that even though, in fact, it would wind up taking decades for this to happen, that this was the beginning of a global village of communication. And, you know, just to be clear, back in the 1960s, there were national television audiences. You know, people in the United States were all watching the same thing. People in Canada were watching a little of what the United States was watching, but also Canadian things, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You know, the BBC was in England. But there really were no international communication communities. And I always like citing this notion of the global village that McLuhan came up with uh, to show uh, how tuned in he was to what was going on with human communication and the technologies that we invented. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Digital McLuhan, which was uh, written in the late 1990s, first published uh, by Routledge Press in 1991, uh, I called it Digital McLuhan deliberately because the point I was making is that decades prior to the digital age, you know, the first personal computers didn't come around until maybe the early 1980s. So we're talking about a good two decades before that, in 1962 in the Gutenberg Galaxy, here McLuhan starts talking about the global village. And that's the way he was about everything. He was teeming with insights. And, you know, uh, I think I was saying last week um, to you and other people in Toronto that Toronto has always been one of my favorite cities in the world. Uh, I guess New York City is my favorite, but the only other two cities that are even in the running are Toronto and London. And one of the reasons why I so love Toronto is uh, Marshall McLuhan is up in Toronto. And my wife Tina and I went up to visit him a bunch of times. We had dinner over his house. And I always tell people, you know, obviously you and I are people who love conversation, but boy, no one I've ever met in my life 
love conversation as much as McLuhan. Mm -hmm. And within, within 10 seconds, he could hit you with some kind of insight that was just pouring out of his head like, oh, he said to me one day, you know, the automobile retrieves the knight in shining armor. So, you know, at first you think, what is he talking about? What does an automobile have to do? But as soon as you begin thinking about it, this McLuhan probe, you realize that he was on to something. Because, you know, when we get in our automobiles, and again, especially in the early 1960s, these big cars with the tail fins and so on, you were, in the 1960s, the equivalent of a knight all decked out in his army, and I don't know, like 1250 A.D. And he just kept pouring out uh, these insights. One day he called me and said, you know, I, I just wrote a piece. I just want to let you know about it. And, and this is also one of my favorites. He says, you know, uh, what the telephone has done, and this now, by this time, it's like the late 1970s, and McLuhan and I are in touch. What the telephone has done, he says, is it's made the outside the only place where we can be private. So again, what is he talking about? And of course, instantly you realize that you know he's right, because if you're at home, and look, just today, even here in 2018, you know, I don't know, these nutcases get your numbers, they call you up with their nonsense, you, know, you block them, they just call back again. So here you are in the privacy of your home, you don't have any privacy from the outside world. But McLuhan's point was, when you're outside, not in your home, you do have privacy, and of course, I was quick to jump on this thought in the late 1990s and since then, because with the advent of cell phones, mm -hmm. which I love dearly, but now we have no privacy of the outside world either because anybody can call us on our cell phone. So that's what McLuhan was all about, just to give a couple of examples. Uh, you know, I could talk about what McLuhan was all about probably for the next hundred hours, <laughs> and I wouldn't run out of examples. Uh, I, might, I might take you up on that. So, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So the, these insights, I suppose they poured from, um, well, he made this differentiation between percepts and concepts. So I suppose uh, McLuhan was about was all about uh, the end of linear thinking, or ra rational, uptight, repressed sort of logical thought that that uh, was part of, uh, according to him, much of uh, the uh, Enlightenment thought, especially in America, which was a country founded on books, right? So so logical thinking was brought on by the book, and then the television was going to uh, turn everyone into a more perceptive person who puts things together for themselves. Ha, ha, right, who is gazing upon the mosaic of all sorts of information and is left to make up their own pattern recognition and whatnot. So, so, um, so what McLuhan ha had with all these insights was his perception, is his attempt to try to have his own poetic style interpretations of the medium themselves. Like he's reading the real world as though it were an art piece or a movie to be interpreted. Right? Is, is that a, does, does that seem like a fair? Um, uh Yes, 100%. In fact, McLuhan and I once had a conversation in which he said, uh, you know, you're a logic boy. You know, you deal in concepts and you write in a very linear way, but you get it. And he was like puzzled about why someone who was a logic boy, as he put it, would get it. And then like his eyes lit up. And his eyes lit up like no one else's eyes lit up. You could literally see, you know, his brain working. He says, ah, I, I know, you know, how it is that you get it. Even though you're a logic boy, you're also a musician. And, you know, he knew about my album, Twice Upon a Rhyme. And by the way, I'm doing a new album of science fiction related news songs. It's going to be released on Old Bear Records in, sometime in 2019. So music has always been a part of my life. And that was how McLuhan explained the fact that I got his percepts. Because you're completely right. He really had a, a lot of... Uh, criticism almost verging on contempt for what he saw as like this restricted linear thinking and truthfully you know I do have uh, I have two feet so it's not surprising I have a foot in both realms and uh, you know I love poetry I appreciate McLuhan I have nothing but contempt for his critics who can't deal with his poetry and I often say people who don't understand McLuhan uh, they're either stupid 
jealous, lazy, or both. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I hate to even say that now because it almost sounds Trumpian, but it is true of, uh, of a lot of McLuhan's critics, these people who are locked into their linear way of thinking. And, and they, they, they couldn't get into the Gutenberg galaxy or understanding media. What, what kind of a book is this that we're talking about, the Gutenberg galaxy? What, the chapters are just a page or two. Yeah. He has, you know, whatever, it's like 160, whatever it is, you know, chapters with titles that are themselves, you know, more than titles. It was a new form of writing. It was McLuhan's attempt to break the written word out of the Procrustean bed that it had been put in and still is in, in many cases. So, uh, yeah, you're completely right. Uh, you know, McLuhan disliked concepts. He trafficked in percepts. And, and that is indeed why he was so effervescent, you know, this bubbling of ideas. Uh, but, you know, as you know from my, you know, writing, McLuhan wasn't wrong about me. I am a logic boy. Mm -hmm. I do like logic. I do like concepts. And, and in fact, I don't think there's a necessary conflict between the two. And in many ways, McLuhan was reacting against the criticism that he got and people he admired uh, got. And by the way, I should mention that Harold Innes, who is generally and correctly recognized as McLuhan's main mentor, he wrote in a very linear way also. You know, so if you read The Bias of Communication, Empire and Communication, you know, and this is great books, which, by the way, I highly recommend. They're brilliant uh, and, and they're foundations of McLuhan's thought. You find someone who's dealing with concepts who writes in a much more linear way. At the same time, though, McLuhan was inspired by James Joyce. He loved quoting James Joyce. And in general, McLuhan thought the poet was a better conduit and a better guide to understanding what was going on, not only in the world of media, but in the world period, than, you know, the traditional linear writer, than the philosopher, uh, you know, even more than most professors, sad to say. Yes. So, you know, that, that indeed captures McLuhan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In, uh, in, uh, from cliche to archetype, um, McLuhan has this book about the idea of how the cliches of today in culture are later on in later decades pulled back from um, the rag and bones shop of the past history, which is now forgotten, pulled back as expressions, as metaphors for the new thing. As they, That's the way that a cliche today becomes an archetype tomorrow, right? And yep. um, so as far as the poetry goes, in that book, he relates it to a book called uh, The Lamp and the Mirror, which is all about how... Um, 18th century poets like uh, Coleridge, for instance, uh, um, talks about uh, this dichotomy between whether your mind works as a mirror, which is merely your senses are mirroring what's going on outside, versus whether this old um, pre-optical science notion of the mind as a lamp, where your eyes have light that shine out and illuminate, and you're sort of co-creating your perceptions, right? You're, you're creating reality as you see it and as you enunciate it, right? So it's sort of um, this whole idea of, uh, of you know, like the inner, you know, light that shines, which which a, lo a lot of Western, like, um, a lot of Western culture is built on this parallel, right? Versus the person who merely mirrors the outside. So when McLuhan brings up that topic, it really goes to illustrate how a poet can be sort of someone who creates meaning out of their sensory imagery so which gets me to the idea of uh the medium versus the content because one, one of McLuhan's famous aphorisms is um the medium is the message or the medium is the massage or the medium is the mass age right and there's that Joycean influence of multiple punnings and layers right yeah the tedium is the message he <laughs> sometimes said that too <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So my whole shtick for the past year, I've been working on this YouTube series called um, Silicon and Charybdis, where I'm trying to reveal digital computers as what they are, as um, a configuration of highly complex uh, electronic circuits, which work, uh, which, I mean, the original computers were, were built out of telegraph relays, right? It's, it's about the, st instead of an analog signal, where uh, the power levels fluctuate in accordance to, say, sound waves or according to um, the intensity of a light dot on a cathode ray tube. Um, a digital circuit 
The state of the circuit is constantly ch changing. Click, 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 click to the tempo of a clock speed, right? So I've got a two gigahertz computer here. So, you know, two billion times a second. This whole configuration of, uh, of circuits is going click, 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 procedurally changing one after another um, in a way which is interruptible by inputs and outputs, right? You could have a closed state computer that, you know, you know where it's going, but computers are special because after um, the orientation of all the circuits has been uh, pulled up by its own bootstraps, so to speak, all, all the circuits have to be in a relation to every other circuit. We're talking millions of millions of circuits that all have to um, be related to one to each other in a logical pattern. So, so that configuration is bootstrapped. And then um, input and output can interrupt that configuration. And somehow, at the end of the day, it all results in meaningful pixels that give us, you know, pictures and images and sound waves. And here I am talking to you, right? So I've been really trying to dig into the human history of how this evolved because I'm rather worried about people looking at machines as things with agency as opposed to things which are created and controlled and understood, you know? Um, and computer literacy is, a, I think, a huge part of... Uh, talking about Marshall McLuhan. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I, I do. But first, let me just touch uh, base on one of the earlier points that you made, the, you know, this cliche to archetype. And, uh, you know, people often forget that McLuhan was not only a futurist, that is, he was writing about the future, as we were just discussing in terms of the global village, but he was an incredibly well-versed, encyclopedically-versed historian. And, and so that's, you know, where this cliché to archetype came from. And I have to say, there's almost not a day that goes by in my life that I don't think of an example uh, of how something from the past has now become much more in the present. I was just talking to my class at Fordham University uh, the other day, my digital media and public responsibility class, about how the Nazis and their notion of Lugan press, lying press, and I'm not the first person to point this out, but you know, to put in the McLuhan-esque, uh, you know, framework, uh, to some extent, that's a cliche. You know, if you're talking about the Lugan press in the '60s, '70s, I mean, Hitler was gone, the Nazis were gone. But now it's come back in an incredibly big way. It's become an archetype of our time in fake news. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when the American president, Donald Trump, denounces any news that he doesn't like as fake news, he is doing exactly what Joseph Goebbels and Adolf Hitler did back in the 30s whenever the press published things that they didn't want. So this cliched archetype is really, uh, I'm glad that McLuhan used it as a title of one of his books because it's one of his most important concepts. Now, in terms of what you're talking about, let me just say in general, I think it's extremely important that you are looking at the hardware in terms of what is making our digital lives possible. For a variety of reasons, uh, it's hardware usually is not as easy to understand as software, and, and, and it's not on the surface. And, and again, this is, you know, the medium is the message. Most people look at the content, what the hardware delivers. And, you know, they, they sort of, they know that the hardware is there, but either they're not interested or they, they just don't have the ability or for whatever reason to, to focus on it. Uh, and there are many, many examples. Uh, I haven't delved into uh, computers uh, the way you have, but one of the things that I frequently talk about is... I mean, it's very obvious, but it's not often talked about. You, you talk about social media, and, you know, I always point out, and, you know, other people point this out, that if you think about the appearance of social media, how new they are in our world. So, in particular, Twitter yeah. and YouTube, where this, you know, podcast is going to be uh, posted. You talk about 2006, 12 years ago. But still, YouTube and Twitter are content. I mean, they are media it, it, which have their own content, but they themselves are content. They're apps that live mm -hmm. and work on hardware. And no one talks really about what kind of computer does Twitter store 
its material on. One of the things that I've tried to shed a little light on, uh, that's again why I'm happy to see you looking at that deeper hardware, is you know just the fact that the iPhone is not introduced until 2007. And it, the iPhone is a crucial component in the advent of social media, or what I call new, new media. New media being digital media, new, new media. So in other words, Amazon, if you buy a book, an old-fashioned printed book on Amazon, that's new media. Mm -hmm. But uh, if I write a book and I put it up there as a Kindle, Amazon has become new, new media because I'm not only using Amazon to buy books, I'm using it to create a book that I put out there to the world. And as we know on Twitter, people use Twitter all the time to create uh, information and put put their words on Twitter. Again, that typifies Donald Trump's presidency in many ways, but it typifies many, many things. But most of that is done, if we're talking about Twitter, on smartphones. And, and so the iPhone and what it did in 2007 is crucial. In fact, when the iPhone was first introduced, one of the things I realized is what, that what the smartphone does is it exiles useless places from our lives. And here's what I mean. We're waiting for something, right? Whatever it is, we could be waiting in an airport. We could be waiting online in a store. We could even be in an elevator, waiting for an elevator in a skyscraper. Those are useless places, meaning that we can't do much, right? The elevator is in many ways the worst. We're a captive audience, both waiting for the elevator and even more so when we go in the elevator. But with a smartphone in our hands, suddenly... That's no longer a useless place. Mm -hmm. And so that's just an example of how that hardware uh, works. And, you know, I think that what you are probing, l looking at what's inside, you know, the, the digital connections in the computer, that's not a footnote or an afterthought. That's a probe of the very essence of the digital world we live in. And it, it, it's the same as... Okay, you and I are talking, we both have minds, we have personalities, we say things, but who we are is integrally and intimately tied into our physical bodies. Uh, in fact, there was a French philosopher, Maurice Merleau-Ponte, and he had a great phrase, uh, I won't you know, bother your listeners or viewers uh, with the French, but the English uh, translation is the metaphysics of the flesh. And so what Merleau Ponte was talking about is you can't understand human intelligence without understanding the situation of our brains in our bodies. It's not just, you know, a minor point. And, and that's why, again, what, what you're doing uh, with... Uh, you know, computers is very, very crucial. I've written a little bit about artificial intelligence, and, you know, my own, you know, I guess influenced by McLuhan, I've come up with a lot of puns. They're usually lamer than McLuhan's. Um, but I, I think that uh, if you are talking about human mentality without talking about flesh, without talking about the physical being, you're putting Descartes before the horse. Uh -huh. Yes. Oh, my God. You'll probably lose like half your listeners as a result of that. <laughs> Anyhow, so, so I, you know, I am very interested in your work. I'm going to gonna read more of it, and I hope you continue uh, doing it. And I, and I have to say, you know, just to give you a little advice, putting on my researcher and professor hat, the more original and unusual your work, the more difficult it is to get it out there. Uh, again, the Amazon Kindle, YouTube changed that, so you're able to get your work up on the web, you can put something out on Amazon or on YouTube. But traditional publishers, unfortunately, they don't know what's going on. Every once in a while you find a publisher who does, but uh, I'll never forget, you know, after McLuhan died in December 1980, I knew a, an editor. I'm not going to mention his name. I don't want to embarrass him. I have no idea whether he's even still alive. But I'll mention the press. It was St. Martin's Press. And I called him up. I said, you know, you probably heard Marshall McLuhan passed away. He said, yeah. 
And I said, you know, I've written a couple of articles about him. Uh, he said, yeah, you know, I've, I've come across them. I said, I have an idea for a book about McLuhan. Mm -hmm. And he said, McLuhan is finished. It's 1981. No one is going to be interested in his work. He had, a, you know, his time in the 60s. So anyway, th that book eventually became Digital McLuhan. But, uh, you know, so th unfortunately, there's an inverse relationship between uh, the originality, you know, of, of what uh, researchers like you are doing and how easy it is to get other people to uh, to recognize it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean... I, I get that advice also from a different vector because uh, I'm 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 very much part of understanding the hardware and understanding the software as content is uh, the notion of free software. Um, Richard Stallman's idea of you know software where the user has a legal entitlement to see the source code of the programs they're using. So operating systems like GNU Linux, for instance, and nobody wants to hear about that. I get told again and again and again, man, you're gonna bore everyone to tears. No one cares about free software. People just want to use their phone. People just want to use their computer. They don't care how it works. They don't care about this legal contract, right? So I appreciate uh, what you right. <sighs> I suppose it's going to take some art to make this interesting and accessible, which I guess is kind of what I'm trying to do here because it is a very human story. And so and right. we talk about, you know, Edison and we talk about Nicholas Tesla as great inventors, but then as soon as the inventions and the innovations turn microscopic or as soon as they become these abstract things happening in a, in a, you know, a cyberspace, which is, seems to be, divorced or floating away from physical reality that's when that's when all the public awareness or excitement stops right uh, they all the excitement moves towards the marketing of you know the feature list on this new app that they that you just update and you know oh it does this for me oh it does that for me not here's how it does it right like yes well it's interesting a, a long time ago th this goes back i mean it's actually just a couple of years before uh digital McLuhan, you know my first really well-known book the soft edge a natural history and future of the information revolution i have a chapter in there about intellectual property and just to be clear i agree with you i don't think money is the most important thing although i do have sympathy for the point of view that people should get paid for their creations. So I, I, I wouldn't say I'm in favor of giving everything away completely free, but for example, as an author, I'm delighted that my books are in libraries where people can take them out for free. I don't mind if people buy my books and I get you know a royalty of money for it. So again, I have a foot in, in both uh, worlds. But um, what does interest me about intellectual property and speaks directly to the point you're making is credit for the work. So uh, I don't mind, uh, and I would never sue anyone if somehow someone like, you know, stole one of my books or whatever and didn't pay for it. You know, as a matter of fact, there's like an old joke. I mean, I, I think I once... Uh, I can't remember exactly what happened. It, uh, it, it was back when I was teaching at Fairleigh Dickinson University. Oh, yeah, I remember now. And there was a, a professor who came into my office. He was all upset because he, his car was stolen. Somebody stole his car. And he mentioned, like, as an especial grievance. And, you know, I had a whole box of my books. That were just, you know, one of his books had just been published. I had a whole box of my books in the trunk. And I said to him, so what are you so upset about? So this guy who stole it, he'll probably be very interested, you know, in, in your books. Mm. So, I mean, all right, so maybe that was pushing it a little bit too much. But what that would bother me is if somebody took one of my books and somehow put their title in as the author. And this speaks exactly to your point. We all know who Steve Jobs is. We know who Bill Gates is on that level. You know, we know who Jeff Bezos is. Uh, we know who Elon Musk is. Those people at the very, very, very top, they receive all the publicity. But they didn't actually invent all those things. And, you know, I you know support a lot of what Elon Musk does. I, you know, I'm a great advocate. You and I haven't even talked about this, of human beings getting out into space. You know, I, I actually published a, uh, an anthology with um, a co-editor, Michael Waltermoth, called Touching the Face of the Cosmos on the Intersection of Space, Travel, and Religion. I think we need to bring religion, not that I'm such a devout uh, religious person, I'm not at all, but I think that religion, you know, could be something 
something that could be usefully plugged into this, I think, this incredibly important need that we have to get off this planet. Not leave the planet, but some of us get off the planet and begin to explore the universe. Um, so I, I like Elon Musk a lot. I support his work. But he, here's you know what I'm saying that relates to your point. I would like to know the names of the people who worked on the various projects that make the SpaceX possible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or for that matter, the Tulsa automobile. Uh, and so in this, uh, you know, chapter on intellectual property in the Soft Edge published again way back in 1997, not that long ago, but it seems like, uh, you know, it is the last, uh, you know, century. The, uh, the I make the point that it will be trivially easy in in any app that we see. Uh, and I, we didn't call them apps back then, we called them programs, but it would be trivially easy for the person who invented it, all the people who invented it, to see their names. Mm -hmm. And even though it's trivially easy, you don't usually see this. You know, the only place I see this is Photoshop, as a matter of fact. You know, if you call in Photoshop, right, you see a list of like 500 names of everyone who worked on it, but good, yeah. that's the point. And I think inventions don't happen accidentally, meaning even if they're an accident, it takes a human being to say, ah, I can see how this could work. They certainly don't arise in nature. You know, maybe you could say mutations are inventions, but I don't think there's a mind behind mutations. They just happen. And because inventions are human, I think it would help uh, our world a lot if the human beings who created the apps, along the lines you're talking about, receive credit for it. Mm -hmm. Whether or not they're free or not, that's a different uh, issue. I mean, you've probably heard of Stuart Brand and the Whole Earth uh, Catalog, you, you, you know, and his famous uh, phrase, information wants to be free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first time I heard him talking about that, uh, I remember I, I was like on a panel with him, and when it was my turn to pipe up, of course, I usually say something provocative. Why else would I be there? I said, well, Stuart, you know, information may want to be free, but creators of information need to eat. And, you know, again, we have to find a balance between those two things. Charging a fortune for an app, um, making it not available to people who are indigent, that's not the way to go. Mm -hmm. But nor, I think, should everything be totally, uh, you know, free. So there has to be a way that we can get a combination of both, I think. Right, right. Well, I don't expect everyone, or even, like, everyone to use the computer the way that I do, right? So, for instance, I'm not thinking in, in terms of specific programs. I'm thinking in terms of, you know, file formats and protocols, right? Okay, I uh, need to edit this audio file. I need to extract this the audio from this video file, right? There's 27 different tools to do that. I'll use what, what, whatever one I've got, right? So it's like when you've been using a computer long enough, there's this general, there's just these general principles as opposed to someone who, uh, they go to Google, they type, you know, mp3 extractor program and the first five ones on the list you know it's like oh here's the free trial version right and that's your right. the method of using a computer that's the way most people are are going to do yeah. it um yes there, there's a whole history of uh um sp speaking of giving credit to the inventors or uh ideas one person who i'm focusing on in silicon and crib this is alan k who uh, worked at xerox park which uh they, mm -hmm. he's the guy who thought of um of uh, instead of the contents of a computer being telegraphy equipment or you know the do 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 basically because com right. com computers basically grew up as extensions of the telegraph or uh, which became the uh, teletype and the teleprinter which was like a modified mm -hmm. typewriter and he's the guy who said no 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 let's create this virtual abstract space the Macintosh model of icons that you know Windows has or right he came up with all these med med metaphors for this virtual space and then they try it and then found a way to make the hardware fit that model and this was the invention of object oriented programming uh, which is how I, I, nearly everything is done today and the idea of, of the software in your computer being built up like Lego blocks you know um, just this whole cognitive model where everything in the computer <coughs> is abstract and humanly me meaningful so uh, this is the invention of um, of cyberspace but uh, 
when I use my computer, I'm I'm not running Windows or Mac OS, so all of my programs, like you said, ha in the about box, you can see a list of all of the developers, and then you can go see what parts they contributed, and you can go read their code, right? So free software is an entire community of people building things in their spare time or at work. I mean, most of the free software is developed by companies like Intel and IBM and Microsoft and uh, Red Hat and SUSE, and uh, they're all government pro pro projects. Uh, it's just... It's interesting because if you want to learn computers, you can have it all for free. But for the most part, the market model is still going to exist for a long time coming where the app store, you know, throws a couple bucks to the developers. It's, it, it's interesting because I'm going to be soliciting um, sponsors for this podcast on Patreon.com. If you like this content, shoot me some bucks on Patreon.com. And uh, you hear that more and more and more if you're on the internet today. This idea of uh, the return of, well, the retrieval, we should say of the uh, of the artistic patronship model of uh, funding art and funding content creation because right. um when we have <clears throat> these platforms which which is the new the new term for um website app hybrid right e everything's a platform nowadays right um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. youtube twitter they um you know they they are beholden to advertisers and they have an obligation to regulate and keep you know their uh, platform you know uh, sort of um, clean and appropriate and socially responsible in the same way that newspapers or traditional magazines have. Whereas in the larger digital milieu, it's kind of a wild free for all, which is where I grew up, right? So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I think this is definitely where it, actually we can tie this back to the notion of fake news, just the um the um the obligations of reporters to you know um adhere to uh, uh journalistic ethics and whatnot and to um you know rely on authoritative sources and and, and to uh, you know use the, use the best information is all sort of you know surrounded on all sides by the free for alls of random people with a, a computer which i'm kind of terming life in the foam people outside who, who for mm -hmm. one reason or another are are uh, you know talking to everyone and getting their brains scrambled trying to figure out the truth if they step outside of news right so yeah well i mean a couple of things you said a lot of uh significant things let me just say um another plug for smartphones um you know so as i mentioned i write songs and i got this app free app called record or record it so it means i you know if i'm sitting down at the piano writing a song you know the lyrics are obviously easy enough to write down but I want to make sure I remember, you know, and I could write down the chords. But you know, it takes a long time to write down the actual melody. I can do music notation, but this free app, you know, on my phone, I just turn it on, and you know, so I wrote a song, Samantha, can't you see? There's no anyway, and so I'm not going to forget that because you know, I, I have this little free app. Or another example, I'll give you two other examples of great apps on the phone. Here in New York City, uh, you know, I'm sure Toronto is the same. There's no big city that doesn't have these meters, you know, uh, you know, downtown or whatever. Meaning you park, you got to plunk in, you know, at, at best, you know, maybe it's going to be like a quarter for 15 minutes. And for years, you know, my wife and I have been saying, here, you know, we're going downtown, we're going to have dinner with some people, and you know, by the time we so we park in the car, it's only at the meter. You can only put a an hour's worth of money into the media, then you have to come back and feed it with more money. Yeah. And, you know, so, and of course, you know, I'm right in the middle of dinner making a scintillating point as I am to you right now. And, yeah. I'll, you know, the alarm goes off in my phone. I have to run out like an idiot and plunk more quarters in. Yeah. Well, I don't know, about seven or eight months ago, the, the, and obviously New York City is doing this because it helps them make more money, but still, it's a free app. And now, when that kind of thing happens, w what you do is you photograph a number that's on the meter after you put the money in, and then you're in the restaurant, you call in the app, you put in the number, press it, and boom, you're, it's like being there putting in the quarters. Yeah. <clears throat> so, that, so that's an example of a free app. Here's another app I'll give a plug to. Um, I can't think of the exact name of it. But Blogspot or Blogger is where I have my blog, Paul Levinson's Infinite Regress. And truthfully, I write my blogs on my laptop because I like the big screen. Mm -hmm. But I'm the kind of person, whether I'm writing a song or a science fiction story or a blog or a book or anything, certainly after I write the first 
draft which I put up there, I'm changing it. And sometimes even later, I'm changing it. And not only that, I go swimming every day. And when I'm swimming, I come up with great ideas. So for five bucks, five dollars, I bought this blogger app from some place, I think, in India. And it allows me to log into my blog and make whatever changes I want. And it's there on the blog. Mm -hmm. Five dollars. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th that's not free, but it's pretty close to free. So I think in terms of what you were what you are correctly concerned about, and I know exactly what you're talking about because I've done some of that too. You, you search, you know, uh, okay, I want an app that's going to capture on the screen, you know, anything I see, and I want a video here. Okay, great. Download the free version. Oh, unfortunately, it only records the first two minutes. I have something to watch record something a half an hour, an hour. That's okay. 45, 50 bucks, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, I, I've bought that, and I agree with you. Those things should be less. Um, but I think, in general, smartphones are leading the way to uh, to a better world. Uh, you know, where, where the apps are either free or they're very mm -hmm. inexpensive. Well, yes, uh, yes. There's um, there's free as in price, but uh, as Richard Stallman's fond of saying, there's free as in freedom, which means. Can you take the source code, or does the law say no reverse I engineering see. allowed? Right. So right. I mean, it's right. a really nerdy sort of um, uh, 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 thing to obsess over. Uh, but um, but when so, there are stories about you know applications that are stealing your personal data and no one knows, and Apple has to remove this app from the App Store because it turns out it was mining bitcoins on your phone for someone else, right, overseas or whatnot, right? There's mm -hmm. all these sort of um, the idea. I like being able to see, or the idea that I can trust other people to look down through the interface, straight to the code, straight down to the metal, so that you know what you're looking at. I think mm -hmm. McLuhan was very apt when he said, uh, it's the job of the artist to tell everyone what it is that their environment is made out of, right? And so mm -hmm. I can say today, I'll tell you what your environment is made out of if you let me see the source code, or if you let me take the source code to someone who can read it, right? Mm -hmm. you know, and who mm -hmm. can change it for me, right? There's this element of freedom, which is directly curtailed by the smartphone industry as it exists today mm -hmm. so it's not about price right right you can pay money for free software with a capital f but um yeah so i'll i'll, I'll be exploring this later on in my work to, to okay come, but, but just let you okay. know that that's the direction that i'm taking this all right well, that's an that's an interesting hypothesis you know i'll have to think about that but i think i'm generally in favor of that Mm -hmm. And just so I'm clear, what you are saying is you see no reason why, whether the app is free or inexpensive, why the owner, the purchaser of the app can't drill down, see the source code, and maybe improve it a little bit uh, for his or her own purposes. Yes. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. And I think you know, I mean, the law is beginning to change on that. Mm -hmm. um, there was a time when there was, you know, that was like universally not possible. Well, but I yes. think there's the, this was yeah. the uh, ho see, the hobbyist community of the, in the seventies worked That's on this right. way. Uh, um, it was called the the hacker ethos, right? It was just taken right. for granted that everyone shared everything, right? And right. so the hobbyist right. community today still works that way. It's just as Neil St Stephenson wrote in uh, his book. Um, uh, First, there was the command line, I think is what it's called. In the beginning, there was the command line by Neil right. Stephenson. And, uh, Snow Crash, is that the, uh, the book? Uh, yeah, the author of, of Snow Crash. Yes, okay. yes. He, yeah. he, he, wrote, he wrote this book um, exploring the idea of uh, free software as a bunch mm -hmm. of nerds on the side of the road selling tanks for free, gi gi giving away tanks across the street from the Apple dealership and across the street from the Microsoft dealership. And right. Everyone's going to the Apple dealership where they're getting their custom fancy com computers while the nerds are saying, hey, take our free stuff, and no one wants it because it's ugly and hard to use, right? Right, right. <laughs> Which yeah, has kind of, yeah. kind of been, you know. See, that's the computers I grew up in my whole life. So uh, so this podcast is called Life in the Foam because I'm trying to like uh, articulate that um, the digital environment around us is so much more abstract and complicated than you would get from... 
uh, you know, a Consumer Reports magazine and um, the news reporter who told you to tell us what, what you think about us on, you know, Twitter. And everyone goes and they buy an Apple phone and they join Twitter. Right, and, right. And now we, we, we have these flame wars and people's lives being ruined over Twitter drama. And you've got all these trolls, which, which um, well, from my perspective... That was predictable, but that's because I grew up in a different digital environment. Right, I was the nerdy kid watching movies on my pocket PC in 2003, five years before everyone else started doing the same thing on their iPhone, right? So it's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. canary in the coal mine here, to talk, talk, talking to everyone else. I, I know where this right. is going, right? <laughs> right, right. Well, a um, couple of things. I don't see how access to source code is going to stop the idiots who are screaming and yelling at each other mm. uh, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. But that aside, one of the things which I think, um, I don't think McLuhan talked that much about it, but I talk a lot about it. Years ago, I tried to come up with an example of a technology that was undeniably completely bad so the first thing that came to my mind was the gun and actually I do think here in the United States our laws are insane you know we, we need to have far less guns out there as in almost none in public hands and, and I'm sure some people if they hear this are gonna go ballistic but too bad they're wrong but I don't think the gun is an ipso facto evil technology because I can imagine how the gun, you know, you could be out in the forest and, you know, there are no, there are no plants around to eat and you're glad to have a gun. You know, you know, I love little rabbits, but I don't want to starve to death mm -hmm. and you're not going to get a rabbit by throwing a rock at it. <laughs> so, all right. So then you can move it up. Uh, what about, uh, Nuclear weapons. I mean, they're pretty atrocious. You don't need nuclear weapons to eat. But nuclear energy has done good things, right? I mean, you, you can use nuclear energy in a safe way, sometimes for power. It has good medical effects. So no matter how far you go, you can't think of something that is just ipso facto bad in a technology. So what about the other way? All right, a good technology. How about a pillow, right? Well, uh, in the hands of a homicidal maniac, mm -hmm. a pillow can be used to suffocate Even somebody. Even a pillow, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So how about medicine, you know, vaccine? Unfortunately, that science is also the basis for germ warfare, understanding, you know, how bacteria, viruses, whatever attack the body. So there's no such thing as an ipso facto good technology. No. Therefore, ergo, I think all technologies in one way or another are knives, literally two-edged swords. They can be used to cut food, good. They can be used to cut people, bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and to get back to your point, that is true of Twitter. That's true even when the source code is available. Um, it is intrinsic to technology that Ultimately, it's the human use of it that determines whether it's good or bad. That doesn't mean that it wouldn't be very helpful for society for some technologies to be strongly limited, like the availability of guns. But it does mean that when you're talking about something like Twitter, short of basically banning human beings from Twitter, and that would mean it wouldn't exist anymore, you're going to have people who abuse it. Mm -hmm. And I don't, there's nothing you can do about that. And it's basically a hopeless case. You know, Twitter and Facebook and, you know, they all try, you know, I mean, Twitter, I guess, is the most libertarian um, because they they have the greatest tolerance for some really disgusting they, people. They took the longest to ban Alex Jones out of all yeah. the rest of them. You know, exactly, yeah. exactly. So, but you know what? That's not going to solve the problem because there are other Alex Joneses out there, and that's that's basically the point. Mm -hmm. What well, technologies do is magnify humanity and human impulse, and I think just as human beings can do good and bad. So the technologies enable that. 
Right, right. I think um, that's very true. And uh, technologies enable that because technologies are extensions of us. Right, right? McLuhan was mm -hmm. very fond of saying, you know, the foot is an extension, right. or rather the wheel is an extension of the foot and right. whatnot. And then electric media is an extension of our nervous system. That's and, right. And I'm beginning to think that... Um, uh, I'd like to think of the availability, the the fact that everyone has a cheap digital camera. Like how 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 long have cameras been digital? How how long have they had screens that let you actually see immediately what it is you just recorded? This is yeah. personal instant replay technology. It, right. it, it's a mirror, right? So that's right. Every person has their own ability to uh, instantiate their face, their voice, everything they do they can extend your body directly into cyberspace right yes. you can start with yes. something like second life for instance yes but, um, that's right so so the fact that uh, we have this sort of cyberspace which is which is i think too frequently viewed as either just a little box which i which you know oh yeah it's just well, one more tool that i use or some people um i'm guilty of this make the computer my whole life right and then you know it's sort of um your senses are all directly going through this device, which speaks to your, 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 it's very, um, Kantian in a bad way to go back to what you were saying before about the mind body connection. It's easy to lose your body or, you know, when you are, um, so when your mind is so active in a way, mm -hmm. which is interfacing mm -hmm. with a device totally right. divorced from absolutely physical reality. Right. Yeah. Well, Edmund Carpenter, who, as you know, worked with McLuhan in the 1950s. He was an anthropologist uh, they co-edited a journal called Explorations. Some of the best essays in that journal were later published as Explorations in Community in Explorations in That's a good I can't even remember the name. It's Explorations in something. Mm -hmm. Anyhow. Um, but Edmund Carpenter made this point, which again instantly strikes you as so important and so true that um when we're using media like this, we become angels because we're everywhere at once. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that in, 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 in religious, uh, you know, mythology, you know, certainly in Christianity, I think even in Judaism, uh, angels are described as these beings who can be every place at once. And so when we're on television uh, or when this is on YouTube, it doesn't matter where the person is who's watching it, they're seeing us. Mm -hmm. And if you have a hundred people or a thousand people or a million people watching it at the same time, we're there. Mm -hmm. And McLuhan wrote a lot about this. He called it discarnate man, what you are talking about. And, and it's the same thought that um, b because we're exchanging information, we to some extent lose sight of our bodies. Yeah. Yet it's important to point out that everything we say, everything I'm saying right now, everything you are saying right now is coming through our uh, bodies. So our bodies play, uh, you know, an inevitable role. But, um, w you know, what I think uh, is especially, uh, you know, significant, uh, you know, about, you know, everything that we're uh, talking about is I think that notwithstanding all the work that's been done by people like me, uh, you know, to understand what's going on, we need people like you who are also probing it on the deepest possible level. Because what is 100% true and undeniable is that the speed of technological innovation far outstrips our immediate ability to understand it that's what the problem is in the first place and then the problem in the second place and i try to make this point from time to time and you know again people first say you know, you know what are you talking about but if you think about it i think it's right we understand best that what we grew up with so you were saying you you know you were watching on a small screen when you know you were a kid and so on so, you know, what I understand best, you know, is, is television, because I, I grew up with television. I saw television, when I started watching television, it was brand new. Mm -hmm. And just like my parents, they understood radio better than television. Mm -hmm. Because to that, and I remember my grandfather, a long, long time ago, I guess he understood newspapers better than radio, because he told me once, every time he hears a radio, 
a part of him wants to look behind the radio, and bear in mind that in his day, radios were big things, to see like the man who was hidden, crouching down in back of the radio talking. Because right. it was so right, so new to him. So, I, you know, I've given it a shot. I think I'm, you know, immodestly, I'll say, I'm probably better than most uh, people my age in terms of understanding what's going on now, the new things. Mm -hmm. But we need people like you because you, you indeed are bringing in a, a fresh uh, approach and you'll be able to see things that someone like me uh, might well have missed. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy to um, have the opportunity because, you know, it takes dialogue. It it takes this sort of communication. Um, you know, I, I'm saying things that I'm thinking of for the first time as we talk. And uh, thanks to um, my webcam and the fact that we can look at each other and see each other's right. There's more to it than just voice or text. There's the full... Um, you know, uh, uh, ninety percent of nonverbal. You know, ninety percent of communication is nonverbal communication, and so yeah. you have a term for media which approaches this layer of transibility and invisibility. Anthro. Anthropotropic. Anthropotropic. That's my. T yeah, which is often misstated. Even I think Oxford University uh, Press has encyclopedia. Somebody wrote a piece on me, and talked about my anthropomorphic theory. Anthropomorphic is a common word. That's not my theory. What anthropomorphic means is we tend to look at things as if they're human. Which is, yeah. So, like, if a, if a dog whines, we say the dog is sad and the dog misses us and the dog knows that we're going to be leaving in a few minutes. Oh, the dog has too much cheese. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but anthropotropic is something different. This is, you know, uh, something I developed when I was, you know, as in my doctoral dissertation human replay theory of the evolution of media. And I remember I realized when I was actually going for my MA in media studies, not at NYU where I did my PhD, but up the street at the New School for Social Research, in a program that John Culkin, who was one of McLuhan's earliest supporters, and you could even say disciples, that was his program, John Culkin's program in the 70s. So I, I, I began developing this idea when I realized, hmm, why is it that photography has developed from black and white to color? Mm -hmm. um, and you've just mentioned another, you know, step in photography is developed. Obviously, the Polaroid camera was instant, but now it's not only instant; it's like immediately instant. You had to wait for the Polaroid to develop for a couple of minutes, and you couldn't get it any place. You had to mail it someplace. Mm -hmm. So why did that happen? Why was radio not replaced by television, but it was inevitable that somebody would want pictures to go with the sound? And there are many, many examples of this. And I realized that all these developments had one thing in common. The newer media were more consonant with our biological modes of perception. Mm -hmm. and again, it gets back to perception. So in the natural world, let's say it's a world, let's go back, I don't know, 30,000, 50,000 years, whatever, in which there are human beings, whether they're Cro-Magnon, you know, and they're not yet writing. All they're doing is talking. And for those human beings, every act of communication is a fully sensory act. In a way that, by the way, what you and I are doing now isn't quite yet either because we can't shake hands, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not fully sensory. A sensory. Um, we can't in any way touch each other. Or I'm drinking water, you are drinking water. If, if uh, you didn't have any water, I had another cup here. I said, hey, you know, <laughs> would you like some water? Mm -hmm. So... These fully sensory acts in the pre-technological world were very satisfying, but there was a big limit. You couldn't do anything beyond biological limits of perception. And so that's why the first technologies were invented. But notice that writing, and this is something that McLuhan wrote a lot about, and he told me he really liked this part of my dissertation, Notice that writing allows us 
to transcend time and space, right? I can write something down, somebody can read it tomorrow, somebody can read it 100 years from now. Or I can put it in the mail, or I can give it to someone to walk somewhere so someone who's not in my physical presence can read it. But look at the price we pay. Reality, our full sensory perception, is flattened out into nothing, right? Just squiggles on a page. It's flattened in three dimensions of sensory perception are flattened out into one dimension where the only sensory apparatus is sight making sense of these squiggles. <coughs> so, that stage of technology I call stage B, under the pressure to burst out of the biological limitations, we surrender a lot of our full sensory experience in order for the communication to take place. Now, you mentioned the telegraph. So the telegraph is really crucial because the telegraph in many ways is the high watermark of that stage B technology. You're not even dealing with words anymore, right? The words themselves have been flattened out into dots and dashes or beeps, non-beeps, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. that binary code. And then that in turn has to be translated back into words and that in turn you know, then uh, approximates the written word. That's the telegraph. But what the telegraph does is it ignites people are saying, hey, you know what? I can send my written words to people, but wouldn't it be great if I could send my voice to people? And that's what Alexander Graham Bell does with the telephone. And so that's the beginning of stage C, technology and and so the anthropotropic anthropo meaning human as an anthropology tropic meaning towards like plants are heliotropic they grow towards the light or the sun so anthropotropic media under human development as they're developed try to do two things continue the extension across time and space but retrieve the lost sensory elements Wonderful. so right right now you and i have a conversation again so it's, it's pretty good this is much better than alexander graham bell's day where we're now talking and we see each other that's great two crucial things sight and hearing but we're not yet completely there being completely there would be what it would be some kind of teleportation yeah so you and i met each other last week, but I, I had to fly up to Toronto, you had to get down, and, you know, the ultimate apex of anthropotropic evolution is the merging of talking and walking, mm -hmm. meaning, you know, the communication and the physical. By the way, I did want to mention, uh, you, you said something about second life, and, um, there is a, a media theorist by the name of Ken Hudson, who actually lives in the same town as Andrew McLuhan. So Andrew probably knows who Ken Hudson is. And you know, I'll, I'll send you, I, I can connect you on Facebook. Sure. And, and yeah, uh, anyway, the reason why I mention this is he, I don't know, maybe about 10 years ago, I don't remember exactly when, he did a series of interviews in Second Life and among his guests were Eric McLuhan and me, two separate interviews. So you could see my avatar at second fly. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I have such a, I have such a cheapskate. I, I, you would be, you would approve of this, Clinton. I didn't pay for, you know, you can pay like whatever it is. What's it called? Uh, something, do something. Linden yeah. dollars or something. <laughs> right. Or only Bitcoin. You know, and, and, yeah, so absolutely not. So I went, you know, cheapo than I am for the free. That's <laughs> <laughs> the way to do it. So, Bare minimum. So I, I just like stuck a mustache <laughs> <laughs> and some, uh, you know, face. Yeah. And, and a bunch of hair and whatever. So, and you can see me talking there. Anyway, so, but Second Life is an interesting precursor because they were trying, you know, again, it was it was not three dimensional, but in a way, what Second Life. It was, it, it was, you know, like part of the ladder in the anthropotropic evolution towards, 
you know, greater sensory uh, involvement. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well put. And um, I, I just always would like to remain vigilant that while we connect people closer together in these m more multi-sensuous modes where we, we do feel more and more in physical pr proximity, at the end of the day, I'm right now sitting here all alone in my bedroom talking at a bunch of pixels and a little, you know, speaker diaphragm and you yourself right. all alone right. talking to no one. And, uh, you know, if, right. if our brains weren't able to put together these dots in this mosaic of pixels back into someone, right? The, That's right. The autonomy, the control, the humanness is always at the end of the day going to be people talking to people. It can, be, exactly mediated. Right. It can be mediated. But more important is to keep that foot that's planted in the immediate, I think, a little bit firmer mm -hmm. than, than to delve directly into cyberspace in a way which people talk about like it's something that's coming. Oh, I bought this VR goggles and pretty soon I'll be able to right. go into it. No, we've been doing it for decades. It's, 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 this is long gone, right? Just because that's there's right. a little picture frame that you have to stare at doesn't mean this isn't any less a, an out-of-body experience. Than, than people a hundred years ago were having in the movie theater dodging the train coming at their face, right? Absolutely right. That's a great example. Uh, I think it was the Great Train Robbery. <laughs> uh, it was like 1900. And, and again, that, that indeed... Uh, but you know what? It's easy to laugh at those people. I used to laugh. I don't laugh at them that much anymore because uh, we're no different. I think it was the remake of The Fugitive uh, so the so Fugitive was a, a, an American television series, I guess, maybe late 60s or early 70s. It, and they made a movie out of it. I guess, I don't know, mid to late 80s, early 90s with Harrison Ford. And there's a great scene where he, like, jumps off a train because he's trying to escape. And then they switch the shot and he's, like, on the track and the train is coming at him. Mm-hmm. I remember my wife and I were seeing that movie. We both like sort of flinched. <laughs> yeah. So we're no different than the people in 1900, you know. They're, and again, that's good movie making. It's a visceral reaction. That's what they want to the to the images you see on the screen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, the art of directing is is you know to try and capture the art of the stream of consciousness. It's memories mediated. Right, the same right. way your mind in a memory edges out the boring parts, you remember the parts that stick, right? Yeah, by the way, you should read. Here's another recommendation. I'm, I'm always uh, full of recommendations. In case you haven't seen this book, uh, it's called The Photo Play, and it was written by Hugo Munsterberg mm -hmm. in 1915. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, there's an interesting backstory. He was, uh, you know, German nationality. The U.S. got involved in World War One. He was a professor at Columbia. He was shunned to some extent, not by everyone, but by you know some of the faculty and students because he was German. And he was a philosophy professor, but he loved film. And so he took the time that he wasn't in the classroom, even though he wanted to be in the classroom, to write this book, and it's a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And it deals with what you, are, what you and I are just now talking about. Wonderful. One more book to add to the pile. There you go. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, well, we've gone a little bit over an hour here. Um, if, uh, if you've no pressing concerns, I don't mind taking this to an hour and a half, if, if, if you would agree. Let's do it. Absolutely, absolutely. Fantastic. The first extended episode of Life in the Foam. Another plug, if you like this sort of stuff, you can find a link below, uh, patreon.com. Also, oh, patreon.com slash Clinton the Geek. Also... Last night, I got word that this iTunes uh, iTunes has approved this podcast for a syndication on uh, all Apple products. So if you like to listen, you can subscribe on iTunes now. Congratulations! Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're we're making it. Um. So yes. Um. There, there, there. You go. Um. You the anthropotropic principle. Um. I think. Uh. It's a very powerful. Pow powerful explanatory tool thank you because as technology grows more anthropotropic in facilitating human communication without the media awareness of the underlying technology there is a tendency or the danger of people anthropomorphizing inanimate inanimate um you know uh, re right. re renditions you got bots you've got um what's called ai or you know chat bots you've got uh, right. this notion of um the turing test which I think 
sort of, uh, you know, there's a great danger there in so far as what people can uh, be, focus their human empathy and their human love and attachment to ever so more anthropomorphically animated fictional right. cyber things, right? So so that's well, that's one thing I, I, I think was a part of the subtext of um, the new Blade Runner movie, Blade Runner 2047. Mm-hmm. While, mm-hmm. while we're on the the topic of that and the more i think about it the more i think this this can you can look at this in a broad historical sense going all well back to um maybe the mechanical turk which is that old mm-hmm. chess ch- chess computer mm-hmm. which was actually just a guy in a box with magnets move, moving chess pieces right. around right but um you you know this this whole I- idea of uh you know just um iconography even um the tendency for humans to anthropomorphize this stuff which i think McLuhan talked a lot about too yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, the key uh, distinction is, you know, if you want just something to, you know, epitomize this, is the difference between a parrot talking and a person talking. So, you know, the parrot's words sound like human words. And they sound like human words because they are human words. But there's not human meaning in those words because all the parrot is doing is mimicking sounds Mm -hmm. and you know no matter how much you want to dress it up if you're talking you know about siri or you know you know amazon's little device alexa or even big device depending upon its size you know they're glorified parrots and there's nothing wrong with that that's good they're very useful um you know, we all have now GPSs on our phones, sometimes embedded in our cars. There are voices that talk to us. Mm-hmm. But again, you know, it's just a more comfortable program. Yeah. And, you know, to get back, you know, I, I like uh, this lame pun so much to uh, putting Descartes before the horse. <laughs> We're not going to have... You know, AI that is in any sense comparable to human intelligence, I think, until we, and this gets back again to your point about hardware, until we know more about how our minds have arisen in our brains. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, that we, we need that connection. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that always strikes me, you know, and this is apropos, again, of my interest in religion in an anthropological sense. There, there are three big mysteries, I think, in existence itself. And science has not really answered any of these three. It's done a better job, I think, maybe in one than the other two. Anyway, the first one is, how did the universe get here? So... The Big Bang Theory is no answer at all because of what, what caused the Big Bang to happen. Religion doesn't provide much help either except to say, okay, God created it, good. What created God? God created himself, clever, but that's no answer. Turtles all the way down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's one uh, you know, mystery. Second mystery is how did life emerge from non-life on Earth? That we probably know the most about, but uh, I try to keep up on you know research on this. We still don't yet know exactly how that happened. But the third relates directly to what we're talking about. You know, as I'm sure you know and viewers know, it's been noted for like at least 20 more years ever since we began keeping track of genetic codes. Uh, chimpanzees, great apes have over 98% identical DNA to human beings. Yet, there's no McLuhan among the great apes or the chimps. Not only is there no McLuhan, there's not even some dummy who doesn't understand McLuhan, you know, in the way that many human beings are. And, you know, there's no Mozart, there's no Isaac Asimov. So the whole history of humanity can be said to have derived from that little over 1% difference 
in DNA. And that's as far as we've gotten, meaning, okay, that's an interesting recognition, <clears throat> but how did that one point whatever percent DNA arise in a way that it created our brains and our bodies, which led to our minds and in turn, in turn our civilization? And I think that that's you know a really crucial uh, thing to focus on. And the way that relates to what you're saying uh, about AI is no matter how clever, and I don't want to be accused of being a protein chauvinist. I'm not saying that artificial intelligence has to be in a protein form. I'm fully willing to, yeah. you know, accept the possibility that some kind of purely digital silicon, whatever it is, form can be the basis of intelligence. But I think we're not going to crack that problem until we know more a lot more about how intelligent life, i.e. humans, arose from, I don't mean to diss dolphins and great apes and chimps, but let's face it, they're not intelligent in the way that we are. Right. And, and until we understand how that difference happened, we're not going to get too far with uh, AI. It's got to be a slow, slow, gradual over the course of thousands of years development, uh, cult culturally uh, across. You know, like the memeplex that slowly grows over centuries of enculturation and whatnot until you finally get these breakthroughs, like the, the right. fire or or you know tools or or r r writing, right? In the slow, gradual, you know, rem how how many things have been forgotten, right? Like what we know today is what has lasted and survived long enough to become the foundation of the complex, you know, beings mm -hmm. that we are yeah. today. So, so I'm well, glad you mentioned that because you mentioned the Silk Code earlier. This is like one of my primary themes in both media theory and science fiction. Mm -hmm. Because we've been on this planet a long time. And what you just said is completely right. There's an enormous amount that happened that either and was understood that either wasn't recorded at all or was recorded in a form that just didn't last you know not everything was carved on walls or into rocks and you know those things are gone they've deteriorated mm -hmm. so and then of course you have what happened in the ancient library of alexandria it was burned at least three times Many unique manuscripts were lost. Mm -hmm. We know about uh, anywhere from a third to at most a little less than a half of Aristotle's treatises. And we know that we only know that fraction because lists of all his treatises have survived in other places. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Aristotle, pretty bright dude, who knows what he came up with in those other treatises that have been lost to us. Mm -hmm. So... And then this gets back again to Hitler, burning books. Mm -hmm. One very good thing about the digital age, and you know, as uh, I'm sure it's clear to you and anyone who has read any of my books or listened to me uh, rave on about things, I'm pretty much an optimist. And one of the things I like about the digital age, with all its flaws, is the fact that I, I think it's much more difficult to destroy or lose what we have now. I was interviewed, uh, I don't know, a few months ago for an article somewhere about you know digital apocalypses and could I imagine a world or could I imagine it happening in our world that somehow the whole internet was brought down and everything on it was destroyed. And you know my answer was, look, anything is possible. So it's not that I can't imagine that. But as far as I know, you, you can do some very serious things with hacking. You know, you could hack a nuclear energy plant so it blows up. If we have driverless cars, that's going to create all kinds of nightmare scenarios. You might be able to hack into a driverless car and turn it into a weapon. But bringing down the whole Internet, I've never seen anything even remotely possible like that. So I think that's good news in terms of the survival of what we have now out there and up there mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. Done done properly, Did digital preservation. And I mean, this entails things like, um, 
like uh, uh, checksums or verifications to to uh, right. to you know maintain things haven't been tam tampered with, right? This is sort of your du your double edged sword because yes, computers remember everything, but um, you can't revise a newspaper. If a newspaper pub publishes something, it can't be revised. You know, the copy you've got stored un under your mattress, you know, two months later yeah, when right. the story changes or, or, or whatnot, right? So, yes, there are all of these issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just point out, I have a concept for that, too. And again, in my optimistic way, I say that books and even newspapers have reliable locatability in terms of the text that's in them. So, if you turn to page 74 in Digital McLuhan, what you see on that page will be there tomorrow, next month, 10 years from now, I hope 100 years from now, somebody has that book mm -hmm. on her shelf. But, things that are online, despite all the weight advantages, they don't have a lot of locatability because a web page can be brought down anytime. YouTube, by the way, is in my view a horrendous offender in terms of the lack of reliable locatability. Because over the years, uh, on my blog, I posted things, you know, and links to YouTube videos, and then somebody reads something like two years later and said that YouTube video that you posted is no longer online. So yeah, the person who posted it brought it, took it down, or someone else insisted. Mm -hmm. So that can't happen with a newspaper. Well, this podcast is uh, being hosted on uh, archive.org, which is uh, the Internet's pre preeminent, right? If, if there's a place that's not going down, come hell or high water, it's the foundation. The, uh, you know, the, oh, they have, I shouldn't say it's, it's right. the Library of Alexandria of the Internet. That's a terrible precedent. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but something else. Well, good. So then let me say to everyone who's watching this, if the world is burning and a lot of things are being destroyed and the only thing you have to watch is this podcast hang in there there's hope <laughs> <laughs> you'll that's make it. it at least we'll survive that's it <laughs> all right <laughs> absolutely wow wow this is um absolutely wonderful um let's see well what ties everything together here we've got about 10 minutes um yeah, yeah. So uh, it's been uh, very interesting trying to retroactively use the ideas of Marshall McLuhan, especially the ideas of the medium is the message, um, to think about uh, just what computers have done to me or to us. Um, you know, I grew up, as soon as I got a computer age six or seven, I was hooked, right? And my mom would always complain, oh, what happened, right? Oh, everyone's in their bedroom all day, you know, you know like, well, right? So these sort of issues sort of sprung up immediately and as I was editing my documentary series I was watching hundreds of hours of, of YouTube documentaries on computers from the 60s the 70s the 80s finding clips where I could build meaning together to try and rehash the story of computers here um, and really I um, they're the most complex things we've got um, McLuhan would use these metaphors to describe the television like uh, oh uh, the there's a finger reaching out of the TV, uh, you know, caressing your face and entering your mind, right? You're being touched by, by, by you know, this light entering you. He would say, um, the uh, television viewer is the screen upon which things are being projected into them, right? And I mean, mm -hmm. all that holds true for the computer, but only at the highest level, only at the most immediate visible thing. So when the computer started with hobbyists, everyone, everyone knew what was happening inside because you you had to right and then slowly they became easier to use and then as more and more alan k likes to say that uh, technology is anything that was invented after you were born so people who are born with computers and they, i mean there's 12 year olds today who have never known a world without smartphones whereas i can think of in high school no one was sitting around except me with the, with the pocket computer you know right. messing around ignoring whatever's going on right and and so with with all these things catching on so fast, I I feel like there's always the possibility for the people who are c conscious of the change today to uh, fail to pass on things to the next generation of you know their observations, which is why I'm so incredibly grateful to read your book, Cell Phone, and the Digital McLuhan, and to talk to our mutual friend. Harry
Harold Channer there who is, likes to talk about uh, life before television even, right? Mm -hmm. Because seeing our environment for what it is means seeing every layer of what humans created and built up. And uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of things there. Actually, let me just get back to something you said that at earlier in our conversation just now. And I'll get back to recent things. Just like a, a slightly contrary opinion about the medium is the message. Mm. It's It has often been interpreted as McLuhan saying content is totally unimportant. And I think that that's not correct. I don't think McLuhan meant that. He did say content is the juicy meat that the burglar throws the watchdog so to distract the dog so the burglar can enter the house and steal whatever he wants to steal. <clears throat> and so McLuhan was emphasizing the fact that we ignore the underlying medium because we have, we pay too much attention to content. But if you think about it, you couldn't have a medium without content. In other words, if you if you have a television and you turn it on and nothing happens with it, well, I don't know, it's just like a peculiar kind of mirror or whatever that you'll you have in your house. Get bored of the static after a couple minutes and then you'll never get That's right. Again, yeah. That's right. Or if somebody logs on to YouTube and there's nothing there, what, what is YouTube? Nothing. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to uh, to keep that I in mind. Um, and th But then the other point I want to make, you, which is very important what you just said, and this also relates to something I was sort of touching on a little earlier, I have like a phrase for almost everything. There's something I call the first love syndrome. And it it it, it pertains to various things. The, the, the most obvious is one day I ran into someone at a science fiction convention and we were talking about Star Trek. And he was saying, oh man, I just love Star Trek, the motion picture. This is like the first Star Trek movie. That movie is held in so low regard that fans refer to it as Star Trek the motion sickness. You know, right? <laughs> and I, I was really stunned. I said, you like this movie better than the original Star Trek series? What? And he said, yeah. And then he said, I mean, it's the first Star Trek story I've ever experienced. And then when I went on to see the series, it didn't quite measure up to that. Oh. And after that, I've seen over and over again what people first experience and come to love, everything is judged against that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I call that the first love syndrome. This is why about you know these endless arguments, which is better, you know, Lord of the Rings, the the novel series, Lord of the Rings, the movies. The the, the answer is it's based on what you experienced first. That's a that's very yeah. poignant because there you go. That's that's excellent because um something that has changed in the past 20 years with broadband internet is the ability for everyone to experience the past, you know, all the culture in the world completely out of order in their own yes. idiosyncratic way. And so yep. the barriers to having something to talk about with, with your friend is sort of increased by that complication. It's sort of like a, well, that's what, this is what this is about. L life in the foam. And life in the foam is to have your own pathway through this infinite cyberspace, which is your own story of discovering the world around you and culture and involvement, but just with this added comp complication of uh, the non-linear temporality that mass media brings together, where everyone watched JFK's funeral at the same time, right? It was a recent yeah. event. But mm -hmm. when you got 500 channels on the television, and you've got, you know, that series from two years ago on Netflix, you're only catching up to now, all right? So that's why... Oh, exactly. I, it, it, yeah. In the immediate world, face-to-face -face conversation and human interaction, that, that, that needs to be your, uh, you know firmly planted foot because more and more I think cyberspace and the digital world that we see through screens and through VR soon um, that's going to be more and more of a maelstrom mm -hmm. that uh, that uh, people are going to have to swim their way out of maybe sometimes if they get too deep into so uh, that about um, that about wraps it up I think this has been a fantastic hour and a half thank you very much professor I enjoyed it immensely. So I've been speaking to you on uh, Life in the Foam with uh, Professor Paul Levinson, who um, studied under Neil Postman, uh, me me media ecologist. You are uh, 
what what is it you told me? Um, you were his. I told. Listen, Postman Neil Postman was a great teacher, one of the best teachers I ever had. But I failed to persuade him in the slightest that, for example, he thought computers were another version of television. He became an extremely hostile critic of all technologies, including digital media. So, as you can tell, I'm very persuasive, right?、Mm -hmm. But I was unable to persuade Postman. So. I often say that Postman was my biggest failure for me as a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, your optimism is welcome here, sir. Thanks again, and、uh, join、Thank、us、you. on the next episode of Life in the Foam coming soon.